Would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time? Thank you, Jesus. Sorry. You may be seated for a moment. I'm going to get into the scripture in a second here. And I uh, just want to thank Brother, Brother Michael and his wife for their friendship. Do you love your youth pastors, your, the ministry team here? I don't know if he's watching right now, but regardless of whether he's watching or not, I wonder if we could just give some honor to Pastor and Sister Lacasio today. Just give them a round of applause. I love them very much. I have known them since uh, I was very, very young. Sister Lena taught me piano, and she did a wonderful job. She's so anointed and so awesome. It wasn't her fault, but I don't really play piano anymore. I was probably not the greatest student. Uh, I still play just a little bit, Sister Elena, don't worry. But so thankful for them and for Pastor Lacasio. And I just love them so much. And I appreciate their ministry. You should feel so honored to have such a great man of God in your life. Can I get an amen? amen. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I give honor to my wife. My lovely wife, Sister Jasmine, and uh, my two baby girls, Ava and Abigail. Love them so much. Amen. Yeah, go ahead, clap for Yeah. As Brother Michael was saying, the, there's absolutely, uh, the presence of the Lord is here today. He's absolutely here today. And he doesn't know it, but some of the things that he opened with, some of the things that he was saying during the, uh, when he came after worship here are just right in line with what the Lord wants to talk to us about tonight. I'm so thankful for his sensitivity and so thankful for all of you. I want to get all those pleasantries out of the way. Why don't you give a round of applause for you today for showing up to the house of the Lord. Thank you. My keyboard player left me. Usually I have some wonderful music participating in all of this. It's okay. Next time. Love you, Sister Kier. <laughs> I'm going to read from the book of Romans, chapter 1. Whatever is customary to you, if you stand, you stand. If you sit, whatever is customary. The book of Romans, chapter 1. Verse 17, and it's a very popular scripture, but it's going to be the foundation of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. I have many more scriptures to go into, but I'm just going to stop right there. And why don't we just pray that the Lord would touch this message and, and anoint us today. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for what you're doing in this house, God. I thank you so much, Lord, that we get to participate, Lord, in your presence, Jesus, that we get to come and hear your word, God, and, and that we get to grow and move and draw closer to you, Jesus. I pray, God, that every single individual under the sound of my voice, that their faith would be lifted today, God. Lord, if there's a need in this house, God, that they would lift up that need to you in faith today, God. That you would meet their faith today, Jesus, and answer their prayers, God. Answer the faith of your people today, I pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, we come to you humbly, Lord. Touch us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my message is simply going to be the end of that verse, which is, The Just Live by Faith. In Daniel chapter 3, again, another familiar story, we, we find three young men in Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 3, verse 15, the king is, has set up a, a, an image for all of Babylon to worship. He has set up a, a, an image for them to bow down and he says when you when we begin to play the music we begin to play the harps and the flute at that time I want you to bow down and to worship the image that I have made but if you do not worship 
you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And then the king challenges these young men of God and says, And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And it goes on to say in verse 16 that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God in whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Amen. And we know that as the music began to play, they decided and they made up in their heart that they were not to bow down to that image. And King Nebuchadnezzar took them, bound them, and in verse 24 it says that he threw them in the midst of the fire. And as they were in the fire, the king looked back in verse 25, and all of his counselors said, Look, king, look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth person is like the Son of God. And we know from this story that the Lord delivered these young men because of their faith and because they decided to not bow to the temptation and to the commandments of the king. In Samuel chapter 17, and I just wonder if you'll follow me just for a little bit, I'll get to the point. Uh, I know many things start off with a big climax. I'm going to build my way to that, so just work with me here, walk with me. In Samuel chapter 17, we see a similar exchange where we see the armies of the Lord on one side of the mountain and the armies of the Philistine on the other. And they stood in the valley of, of Elah. And there was a man, a giant of a man named Goliath, a champion of the Philistines that had come out and had challenged the armies of the Lord, mocking them. And the Bible says for 40 days he stood there mocking them, asking who is a champion that will come forth? Who is somebody that is going to challenge me. And he stood there and he defied that army. And the response, the Bible says in Samuel chapter 17, the response was not like these young men of Babylon, these young Hebrew men that at the commandment of the king, they decided to stand for the word of God. But the response of this army to Goliath's calling and Goliath's mocking and his voice shouting over the valley was that the Bible says they were deathly afraid. That they were fearful. And they didn't do anything about it. And just as Brother Michael was saying in the beginning of service, there is absolutely a voice of the enemy and a voice of the world that is crying out in this time and in this season. There's a voice and there are things that are being done in the world that are standing in absolute opposition to God and standing in absolute opposition to the people of God. And there's going to come a day, if it has not happened yet, there's going to come a day when the voice of the enemy is going to challenge your life, when the attacks of the enemy are going to come against you, going to come against your family and, and come against your faith. And you're, you're going to have an opportunity you're going to have an option to sit in fear or to stand for the word of the Lord. You're going to have an opportunity to respond. And so the voice of the enemy and the adversary is crying out in this season. We see it in our school systems. We see it in politics and government. We see it all around us. It's hard not to see it because it's not hidden anymore. Their agendas are not hidden. It used to be that you almost had to search for it and look for it and find a hidden meaning. But now, it's just far out in the open. Yeah. They're not apologizing anymore. They're doing everything that they, they want to. And they're living according to their own lusts. And they're doing everything based on their own desires, as the Scripture says. That in the end, this is what people will do. They'll be drawn into their own lusts. They'll have itching ears. They won't be able to listen to truth or to receive truth. But instead, they'll live one man and woman after their own heart. And it's open. It's loud. It's proud. It's out there. They're not trying to shy away, and they're not trying to hide it anymore. And it's interesting 
how adversity and how when a giant or a situation comes into our life, when adversity comes, how it can draw out exactly what is in us. Adversity can draw out what's in us and bring that to the surface. It can either bring carnality out of us. It can bring fearfulness out of us. It can bring whatever is in our heart to the surface and our reaction shows exactly who we are. I don't know about you, but it's like that short man who's acting all tough, but then when the big guy comes, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm not going to challenge him. But when the adversary is not there, he's super, super duper tough. He talks a hard game, but then when someone bigger than him comes, he's like, all right, well, I'll just be quiet now. And he's a coward. Because what's in you comes out when adversity comes. What's in you is produced out when you're met with challenges and when you're met with adversity. And so we can either respond in carnality because really we're carnal. We're not pursuing godliness in our free time. We're not pursuing the things of the Lord when we should. And then when the enemy comes in or when the situation comes in, the temptation comes in, what's in us gets drawn out. And that's carnality for some of us. And we see two responses here in the scripture that I, I, I spoke of. One for the, those young men in Babylon who their response, what came out of them was the word of God. What came out of them was a zeal and, and, and a zealousness for the things of God that said, I am not going to sit here and let you tell me to bow to these idols. And so when the voice of the enemy came out, they said it within themselves because the word was in their heart and that's what was produced into their actions. But for the others, for the armies of Israel, they were not submitted to God. They were the armies of Israel, uh, of God. They were the armies of God, but they weren't acting like the armies of God. And they drew themselves in fear. The king and the soldiers were fearful. But David, being freshly anointed and bold and zealous, came and something that was in him, he knew he was anointed. He knew that he had fought the lion and the bear. He knew that he had the Lord on his, on his side. And he decided to say, you know what? This uncircumcised Philistine yes, yes. is coming against the people of God. Who are you to stand in defiance against us? And he was moved... He was moved to stand upon his covenant with the Lord. That's right. And so it's not a question of whether trials and tribulations will come. It's not a question with whether there will be giants in the land or there will be things that will come in opposition to the church. You know it yourself. You know the things that you're going through in life. You know that there's going to be things that come against you. Adversities, whether it's coming from a human person and they're just working in sin and they're working in carnality and they come against you, or whether there are spiritual attacks. We know that there are going to be seasons and trials and valleys. Jesus said it himself, that offenses will come. There are going to be opportunities and there are going to be seasons of attack against us where adversity comes. But it's our response to those things. It's our response to the trials and tribulations. It's not a, a, a matter of whether the valley of the shadow of death will come. It's a matter of our response that we understand who is walking with us. That we understand that though these things are happening in my life, though COVID-19 has happened, though all these things are happening, my response is always going to be faith. And you have an opportunity to go one way or the other. Yes. You have an opportunity in all these things in life to choose what you will allow your mind and your heart to serve. What, you, what thoughts you will allow to come into your heart. What thoughts you will allow to penetrate your mind and to begin to discourage you and cause you to be anxious and fearful. There's a decision that each and every one of us has to make when these situations and trials come. And so God is concerned with our response 
to these trials and our response to the giants and tribulations of life, but so is the devil. And God can take what was meant for evil. God can take all these things that were meant for destruction and use it for our growth and use it for our benefit and use it for ministry and use it to grow the kingdom of God. Or the devil can use us and we can fall prey and give place to the devil for him to steal our faith. And so adversity is going to come. Hardships are going to come. And it's important that we discern what the Lord is doing in our lives. It's important that we discern what's going on. Because I, I don't know about you, but not every single... I know that not every single you know, thing that happens in life is the work of the devil. Amen. I know for many of us, you know, we try to spiritualize every single thing. You know, you... You wake up and you trip and fall. And like, man, the devil put that thing there for me to slip on. Or at times, you know, you, you're driving in your car and somebody cuts you off. And like, man, the devil is just trying to get at my skin to, under my skin today. And we over-spiritualize certain things. You know, I'm feeling sick. No, it's probably because you ate all that junk last night. All right? The devil's not attacking your health. And it's important that we discern that. But I can say... With, with all honesty, according to Scripture, and just being spiritually minded, we know that there are many things that happen in the physical as a result of the spiritual. We understand that, according to Ephesians chapter 6, that we do not wrestle, Ephesians 6.12 if you throw it up there, but we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness and in heavenly places. So we understand that. That we, we don't strive and struggle just against flesh and blood. But we also understand that those principalities and those powers that are set up in high places absolutely use physical means oh, yeah. to attack us. That those same powers and principalities absolutely use earthen vessels and the things that happen in life. He uses groups of people, people in, in places of power and influence. He uses politicians, celebrities, men and women in high places of influence and power. He uses the media for his spiritual influence. He uses social media, CEOs, lawmakers, kings and queens. And while many remain in the shadows, most of the agendas, as I said, are not hidden anymore. And so he absolutely uses people to stand in defiance against the people of God. Right. He absolutely uses politics. He absolutely uses agendas. He absolutely uses the things that we're seeing in the world. Even though he may not have said, I create COVID-19, he's allowed it and the devil is using it for his own good and for his own influences. Right. 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 We understand this, that though the battle is spiritual, we have to discern and see that it's also a physical battle because these things are spiritually influenced. Amen? Amen. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul actually says that those who are without Christ, those who walk according to the course of this world, are walking according to the prince of the power of the air and are being influenced by the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Paul is telling us, he was saying, at one point before Christ, I was submitted to the devil, whether I realized it or not. At one point, when I didn't have the Spirit of the Lord and when I didn't have Christ, I was being influenced by the agenda of the devil. I, maybe I didn't know better and maybe people don't realize that and maybe they don't know better, but anyone who is without Christ is submitted to something right. and they're under the influence of something. And so whether they realize it or not, their actions and their responses and the things that they're doing are being dictated by the plan of the enemy. Yeah. That's why we can honestly say that presidents and, and mayors and governors and kings and queens and all these people, they are being spiritually influenced. Yeah. Their agenda is the agenda of the devil. They are being used to attack the church, whether they realize it or not. 
They're being influenced by the work of the enemy. And anyone who is not spiritually minded and submitted to God is the same. And we understand that whatever it might be in your life, whatever situation it might be in your life, whatever it is that can apply to you, because we all have our nuances. For some, they get super you know, into and angry about politics. For somebody else, they get into you know, movies and social media. Whatever it is for you that you want to apply that to, or whatever situation you want to apply to yourself and think about that you're going through right now, there are... The agenda of the devil through those things is to kill, steal, and destroy your faith. The agenda of the devil is to take these things and the issues of life and the situations of life and his plan is to turn it and use it for his own benefit. To destroy our faith. To kill our calling. To destroy our anointing. The Bible says that he goes about the devil as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. But just as Jesus told Peter, the same is true for us, is that Satan desires to sift us as wheat. Satan desires to sift us as wheat. He he desires to kill our destiny in God. He desires to destroy our faith. He wants to make sure that Anointed young men and women trade in their anointing for discouragement and for the lusts of their flesh. He wants to make sure that when things happen in life that he uses it to cause people to trade in their heritages and to trade in their inheritances and to trade in all the good and godly things for their life because they're in a season of discouragement, because they're in a season of hurt. And he'll use any means to do so. You know, Again, it might not be COVID-19, but there are things that are prophetic in Scripture that are absolutely supposed to happen. Things like pestilences, pandemics. The Bible talks about wars and rumors of war. He talks about famine. He talks about, as I mentioned before, the, the, the state of morality within the world before he comes back. It says that it's going to be like in the days of Noah, where everybody was living according to their own desires and flesh. We understand that in Scripture. We, We see that. We know that as believers. But the devil, if we're not careful, can so easily use the things that God has ordained, even the shadow the, the, the valley of the shadow of death that God has ordained for us to walk through, to teach us and to, and to show us things, the devil wants to use that to bring discouragement to us. One, he wants to use those things to bring us fear and anxiety and to cause us to stumble. And the greatest and most powerful men and women of God have fallen susceptible to this. I've been through this where, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. where you realize after you're in the season, you're like, wow, that was teaching me something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was growing me. That was trying to show me something or put something in my spirit that I wouldn't have had before. But when I was in the trial, I was about to curse God. But when I was in the hell of my life, I was crying out, wondering why God is doing this to me. And Oh, me or my, and feeling distraught and feeling discouraged and allowing the fear of the enemy to come upon me. But look at Job. I mean, the voices of his friends and even the voices of his own heart cried out. And I'm sure it said something like, look, look at you, Job. Look at the judgment upon you. God's forsaken you. God's turned his back on you. Why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? Or we look at John, John the Baptist, who found himself in a prison. He was in a prison because he followed and was obedient to God. Well, look, God, I was obedient to you, and now I'm sitting in a prison cell. Look, God, I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing, but why am I here fighting for my life? Look at you, John, you're in a prison cell. You put all your hope and trust in Jesus. You you stood before Herod preaching to him, thinking that Jesus would spare you from consequence. But look now, Jesus has forsaken you. 
And the Bible says that John sent out messengers saying, hey, Jesus, are you really who you said that you were? And discouragement and doubt began to seep into John. The greatest of the of prophets, Jesus said. He's the greatest of all prophets. And as he sat in that prison cell, he allowed the voices of the enemy and the voices of doubt to come in and challenge. Jesus, are you really who you say you are? And he became offended in Jesus because of the jail cell that he was sitting in. It's amazing, you know, what a trial and what a season of the valley and a season of wilderness, a prison cell. It's amazing what that can do to someone's faith. It's amazing what a season of waiting, what a season of unanswered prayer requests, what that can do to someone's faith. We see Elijah, who had just gotten done defeating all the prophets of Baal. He had called down fire from heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm not calling down fire from heaven every day. I don't see that every day. But he had built an altar, and he had stood for God against the prophets of Baal and against the prophets of Jezebel. And he had called down fire that consumed that altar the prophets of Jezebel were defeated and they, and they were all killed. But Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And Elijah fled for his life. And so right after calling down fire from heaven, we see Elijah depressed in the wilderness. One of the greatest prophets, the prophet that stood at the Mount of Tra uh, Transfiguration, he wanted to kill himself. He wanted to sit there and die. He had walked to a, a wilderness right after seeing the miraculous. And shortly after, sat there depressed and says, Look, I'm just going to sit here and die. And it's written here, it says, I'm no better than the prophets before me. Look, I, I did all this work. God, I stood for you. I did all this stuff. But nobody turned to you. Nobody stopped their idolatry. And now Jezebel is pursuing me. I'm just going to go ahead and hide. I'm just going to go ahead and stay in the wilderness and just die. And isolate myself. And I'm just going to sit here, be bitter, and sit in the seat of the, of the scornful. Have you ever been there? Where you feel like you're in a really good season, you're, you're doing really well, but then something hits your life? And you feel like there's chaos. You feel like you're in the hell of your life all of a sudden. Well, that's what was going on with Elijah. And he isolated himself. And he wanted to give up. Peter, we know his story that he denied Jesus. Denied ever knowing him. And in fact, when we look at the actual scripture, it says that he cursed Jesus. He cursed ever knowing him. One of the greatest disciples the one that said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, Jesus. When Jesus was at his, at, at, on his path to the cross, Peter cursed him and denied ever knowing Jesus. And Peter had a decision to make, just like Elijah, just like John, just like Job. He could either sit there in condemnation and beat himself up and allow the voices of the enemy to be louder than the voice of God in his life. He could sit there and decide to allow condemnation to come upon him and to sit in defeat and say, you know what, you're no better than Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus and you betrayed Jesus, Peter. You're no better than that. But Peter had an opportunity. He had a decision to make. And he decided to go and to weep bitterly and to repent to God. And Jesus eventually restored him. We look at Mary and Martha. Doubt began to sink into, into them because Jesus didn't come and save their brother. They, when Jesus came on the scene, they told Jesus himself, you're like, look, if you, were, if you were just here a little bit sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, if you would have just showed up on time, my situation would have been dealt with. Jesus, if you would have just showed up on time, my trial, my tribulation wouldn't be here right now. And that doubt began to sink into them. Jesus, if you 
were here, I know that my brother wouldn't have died. And that questioning and that doubt and that accusation in their head turned into spoken words and it hindered and stole their faith. Hannah was another one. If you know the story of Hannah, she had gone to the temple. The scripture says that she had gone for about 10 years praying and desiring that God would give her a child. Her womb was barren. And for 10 years, she dealt with the mocking and with the doubt and with the the voices of the enemy speaking to her heart. For 10 years, could you imagine for 10 years having an unanswered prayer request? Where you had gone to the Lord desiring for something to happen, desiring for healing, desiring for a child, whatever it is for you. And you feel forgotten, you feel like he hasn't heard you. And those voices just like Goliath, those voices just like that King Nebuchadnezzar, who's going to save you? Who's going to deliver you? Who's going to take you out of my hand? Who's going to heal you? Who's going to do it for you? It's been 10 years and it hasn't happened. And she could have given in to that voice. She could have after just two years, after just three years, after the fourth year, she could have just given up and said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up on my faith. I'm going to stop coming to the temple. I'm going to stop coming and giving my offering and praying. I'm just going to give up and let go of all my faith. But I believe that there was something that was in Hannah that decided, you know what, the word of God that's in my heart, I'm not going to give up on. I recall what the Lord has done for the others. I recall what the Lord has said for those others. And I believe that he will do it for me too. And there was this boldness that began to come into her spirit that kept her coming back for 10 years expecting the goodness of God. For 10 years, year after year. Pushing away the doubt. Pushing away that voice and those fiery darts of the enemy that come against our thoughts and come against our heart. And said, I am going to stand upon the word of the Lord. I know what the voice of the enemy is saying, but I'm going to believe the report and the voice of the Lord. And I'm going to keep coming back no matter what. No matter the mocking, no matter the yelling of the enemy, I'm going to trust in the Lord. And we know that after 10 years that God finally answered her prayer. And you know what? The son that she gave birth to was the prophet Samuel. And it was the prophet Samuel who anointed David. And whose bloodline Jesus came from. She didn't realize that what she was tearing upon, the prayers that she was praying, was about to produce something far beyond what she could ever realize. And the Lord might have just been waiting for the right time to raise up Samuel so that Samuel could anoint David. But she didn't know that in that time. She didn't know that in that season of waiting. That the Lord had a plan through her infirmity. That the Lord had a plan in her barren womb. The Lord had a plan and has a plan for you in your life through your trials and tribulations. When you're in it, you may not see it. But the Lord is doing something. And we have to be careful. And that's why the Bible says that we are to put on the whole armor of God. That we're to protect our mind, to put on that helmet of salvation, protect ourselves from the wiles of the enemy, the Bible says. That we're to protect ourselves from his devices, protect ourselves from his fiery darts, protect ourselves from the discouragement. Because in every single season that we go through, he is desiring to find that gap in our armor. He's desiring to kill our faith. But the just... No matter what is going on, no matter what circumstance that you're in, the just live by faith. We do not live according to the report of the enemy. We do not live according to the report of the world. When the world and media and, and people in power and others say one thing, we don't dictate our lives and we don't dictate our faith on the things of the world. 
We don't dictate our faith by the voice of politicians and, on, and, and governors and mayors. We don't dictate our lives on those things. But we put our hope and trust in the name of the Lord. It says, whose report will you believe? I, re I believe the report of the Lord. But it's easy to say that when you're not in the midst of the fire. It's easy to say that when you're not in the hell of your life. And those Hebrew young men could have just given in to that pressure and just bowed in idolatry. It would have been easy for them. It would have been easy, just like it's easy for many of us to give in. Just like it's easy for our carnality to come out of us when we're around certain environments and in certain situations. It could have been easy, but instead, that adversity stirred in them a boldness. And I believe with my whole heart that they remembered the Word of God that was supposed to be written on their forehead and on their arms and written on their heart. And as the king stood up and said, I want you to bow down to this idol, I believe instead of, uh, instead of being fearful of what might happen, instead of being uh, doubtful and anxious, that they decided to remember, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one And you shall fear the Lord your God. Serve Him only and swear by His name only. That when the voice of the enemy came out, they remembered that there are to be no other gods before me. And you shall serve no other God but me. He remembered the words that were spoken to Joshua and to Moses and to all the children of Israel that you are to serve me and me only. And if you serve me and if you follow my commandments, I will lead you, I will guide you, I will give you victory over your enemies. And instead of falling back in doubt, their faith began to rise up in them. And they said, you know what, King? I don't need to answer you carefully. I don't need to be careful with what I'm saying because I serve the Lord God Almighty and I know that He is going to deliver me out of your hand. I will not bow to the voice of the enemy. I will not bow to the temptation to doubt and to fall away in fear and to be anxious, but I will stand upon the Word of God. I'll stand upon His Word. And we know that even though there might be some earthly consequences to that, the Bible says that I have overcome the world. I've already overcome all the consequences that might meet you when you decide to stand for my word and when you decide to stand up to your adversary. I have already overcome it. And I've overcome the fiery furnace. I've overcome the trial and the tribulation. And I will stand with my people. And the Lord protected them because they decided to stand in faith. I'm telling somebody today that the trial and the fire and the valley that the enemy is, is desiring to destroy you with, the Lord is desiring to instead birth something in you. Yes. That that same trial and tribulation and that health problem and that issue that you're going through in your life, that though the enemy wants to destroy you with that, that the Lord is wanting to use that for His own good and for His own benefit. And He's wanting to birth something in you. When we look all across Scripture, it's a, we, we look at the enslavement of Egypt. It could have been that the people of God were in slavery, but God took it as, I'm going to raise up a Moses in that generation. And I'm going to use that slavery to deliver my people into the promises that I have for them. So Egypt is going to produce a Moses. The Philistines and Goliath obviously des desired to destroy the people of God. But through that... It, that God used David. Through that adversity, David rose up. Babylon, Persia, Rome, there was obviously and there is spiritual manifestation and idolatry and all of that. And they committed atrocities and served other gods and, and they murdered the people of God. 
But God said, I'm going to go ahead and use that evil for my own good. I'm going to go ahead and use the evils of Babylon and the evils of that world to raise up three Hebrew boys that are going to stand up against Babylon. And I'm going to raise up a Daniel in that generation. I'm going to raise up a prophet in that generation. And so God can use the plan of the devil to benefit his own good. Persia produced an Ezra and a Nehemiah who restored the temple of God. He used all of the persecution of those nations to raise up the Old Testament prophets. He used Rome to raise up a John the Baptist and a Peter and a Paul. And I'm here to tell somebody that when God ordains something and he says something in his word that there is no devil that can destroy it. There is no thing that can destroy it. And God can use, as that scripture says, what the enemy, what the devil meant for evil and use it for my good. The scripture says that the prophet Balaam was bribed by a king to curse Israel and to curse God's people. And the king was asking Balaam, paying him, saying, I want you to go and, and I know you're, you're a prophet and I'm going to pay you and I want you to pray and I, I want you to seek out so that God will curse Israel. And the prophet comes back and he comes back numerous times. And the king says, well, what, what, did, what did God say? And the prophet came back every single time. He said, you know what? I, I've been trying to do what you told me, but every single time I go to curse God's people, he just keeps pouring blessing on his people. Yeah. And, and I've been forced to say this, that God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind or repent? And does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And I have been commanded to bless, and he is blessed, and I cannot change it. Amen. And so in every trial and in every situation, what God has ordained, and when God has a, has a person, has an individual that's going through a season of struggle... God, if he has ordained you and he has called you and he has anointed you, you are going to get through it. And there is nothing that the enemy can do to change that. Maybe at one point before Christ, you were without a helper. Maybe at one point before Christ, you had to fight your own battles. But I'll tell you, there was a day when a greater authority stepped into your life. And when that greater authority stepped into your life, He put His name on you. He put His anointing on you. He put His Spirit upon you. And so now whenever we go through the shadow, whenever we go through the trials and the tribulations, we're not doing so alone, but we're doing so with the Spirit of the Lord upon our lives. We're doing so with a name and a greater authority that is walking with us. There's one thing that is constant in the life of the believer, and that is that the righteous are never forsaken. And the righteous are never left begging for bread. Romans chapter 10 says, Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. Psalm 20 verse 6 says, Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed, that when I call on Him, He will answer from His holy heaven with the saving strength of His right hand. Some trust in in chariots and some trust in horses. But I will remember the name of the Lord. I will trust in the name of the Lord. And the Lord has simply put that word in my spirit and impressed that word upon me that somebody needs to get a boldness in their spirit and somebody needs to get back on the offense against the enemy and against the things that the enemy has tried to drive into your life. And somebody needs to stand up and say, you know what? I am an anointed man or woman of God. The Lord has put his name on me and I don't need to sit here in fear. I don't need to be anxious for anything, but I need to look to the Lord from whence my help comes from. I put my hope and trust in the name of the Lord. And some of us have been so down and we've been so discouraged and torn down in our season, pushed down and, and, and lacking faith. 
maybe just like Hannah, because it's been a while since the Lord has, we feel like He's heard us. It's been a while that our, our prayers haven't been answered. And some of us have taken on some damage. I, I'm not perfect. I'm not trying to say that every single believer needs to just automatically have the faith to move a mountain, but I'm encouraged because the Scripture says that I just need but the, the grain of a mustard seed. That, that shows me that God wasn't really relying on me. God really wasn't relying on my strength all along. He wasn't really relying on me to have it all together. He wasn't just relying on me to have the faith, uh, you know, this giant faith. But all that he was desiring was for me just to believe on him a little bit. Wow. Just to put some faith in him just a little bit. Just a little bit. And he does the rest. But I'm not perfect. I, I've been discouraged. I've been, I've gone through a season I've gone through things that have absolutely discouraged my faith, where it's like, God, why, why even continue? Why? All these other people who, you know, in my eyes, don't trust you, God, as much as I trust you, are getting all their prayers answered. Everybody's driving around in Bugattis and Lamborghinis. And here I am in my hoopty over here, quote unquote, but you know what I'm saying. It seems like other people's prayers are getting answered. Other other people are, are, are being blessed by the Lord, but here I am in my season of winter. Here I am struggling. Here I am sitting in darkness and sitting just waiting for the Lord to do something. And, and, and the enemy uses those moments. He uses those absolutely to attack the people of God. Why do you think many aren't here? Because in one shape or form, they've been discouraged. Their faith in God has been lost. But in Micah chapter 7, it says, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in the darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. And this is the thing about God. In Exodus and throughout the Old Testament, He reveals His character to us. He begins to reveal the aspects of His character and of His name to us. And Brother Michael almost said all of them for me earlier. But he, he revealed Himself as Jehovah Nissi. That the Lord is our banner. And what that means is that when we face things in life, that we do so with the banner of the Lord. That He is our leader. He is our commander. He is our protector. He is our guide. He is our victory. And that's why David, when he was going against Goliath, he said, you're coming to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. I'm coming to you with a banner. I'm coming to you with something greater than all the things that the arm of flesh can produce. I come to you in the name of the Lord, and this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. We have to come to an understanding and declare a few things that we have at our disposal with God. Because it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. That we have these things that are at our disposal as the people of God. That we can call upon His name, that we can trust in His Word, that we can trust in the Spirit of the Lord that is upon us, that we don't live by bread alone, but we live according to the Word of God, and we live according to what He says and what He dictates for our lives. And there are some things and there are some times where I just have to shake myself and loose myself just a little bit and just declare the Word of God in my situation. And I just sit there and I just have to declare that I am a child of God. That I am not some beggar on the street. I am not some person that is without God and without hope. But I'm a child of God. The Lord God Almighty is my God. Elohim is my God. El Shaddai, my supplier, is my God. Adonai, my master, is my God. 
Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Jehovah Nisi, my banner. Jehovah Makadesh, my sanctifier. That the Lord is my shepherd. He is my help. And he is with me. There's some times that we just need to take a step back and start declaring and using the weapons that we have at our disposal. And that's why Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, he didn't even have to hardly answer the devil. He just started preaching the word of God to him. And when the devil starts to come against you and come against your season and come against you in the wilderness, all that you need to start doing, the greatest tool that you have at your disposal is to just start praying and preaching the word of God to him. That's why it says that David was discouraged, but he encouraged himself in the Lord. And I have to believe that he went back to his tent and he went back to those psalms that he had written. He went back to the scriptures. He went back to where it says that the Lord is my shelter and my refuge. He is an ever-present help in the time of need. And he began to proclaim those things over his life. And in Psalm chapter 23, I just want to go through some of these psalms just to declare some things to you today. Yes. In Psalm chapter 23, David wrote that the Lord is my shepherd. And because he's my shepherd, I shall not have any wants. And when it says I shall not want, David is saying that God's shepherd-like care is enough for me. That I don't have to worry about all of my needs and I don't have to worry about what's going on. But the shepherd is over my life. That I have a shepherd that's over me, taking care of me and giving me everything that I need. And so he's saying, I shall not want. Even though I'm sitting in the cave, even though I'm sitting in the wilderness, even though I'm sitting in pain and in darkness, I don't have a need. I shall not want because of who is with me. All my needs are supplied by the Lord. I don't need to desire any more than what the Lord has given me. I don't need anything else aside from what He provides to me. And I trust and I know that though I'm in this season of struggle, that though there's a giant facing me, though there's a pestilence and there's situations of life, I am trusting in my good shepherd. I'm trusting on the Lord. And because He's my shepherd, He will take me and lie me down in green pastures. He will lead me to still waters. He'll sustain us. He'll provide for us. He knows the path and the way that we're taking. He knows the season that we're in. And He will give us substance. He will give us food. He will give us comfort and rest in the valley. It says He restores my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness. In the Hebrew, the words restore my soul means repentance. That He brings me to repentance when I've gone astray. Wow. He brings me to repentance when I've gone about my own way and I've failed and I've, I've messed up. And when I go astray, He picks me up and puts me on His shoulders and leads me back into the path of righteousness. Not because I deserve it, but for His name's sake. And then it says that famous verse, Yea, though I go, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And we have to come to an understanding and a realization that there is a shepherd in the valley. Amen. That there is a God in the valley. That though we go through trials and tribulations in life, that we are still under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. That God is on our side. That God is still with us. And if you would just bear with me, and if you want to try to follow me in the back, media guy, Brother Jimmy, Psalm chapter 91, verse 1. Psalm chapter 91, verse 1 says, He, or she, who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Right. 
I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress. He is my God. In him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the pestilence, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. He shall cover you in the time of need with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid by the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Because why? Because you have made the Lord your refuge. You have made the Lord your refuge. Those who make the Lord their refuge don't have to worry about those things. Don't have to worry about the attacks and the plan of the enemy. You can push those voices and those criticisms and that mockery aside and say, I go to the Lord for my refuge. It says, no evil shall befall you because you've made the most high your dwelling place. No, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over you. He shall give his angels charge over you. Meaning that they are with you. They are with you on your pathways and on your walkways. They are with you in your seasons. They are with you when you walk through this life. His angels are charge over you, are charged over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. I'm going to keep going. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me. He's talking about us. We shall call upon him in the time of trouble. And he shall answer us. He shall be with us in trouble. He shall deliver me and honor me and give us long life and show us salvation. When David was fleeing for his life from Absalom, everybody thought he was at his breaking point, waiting for his surrender. And these are the times that he started writing some of those scriptures about all, how all of his enemies are surrounding him about how he's going through these troubles in life. You can read all those psalms that are saying how he feels like he's alone, how he feels like everybody else has forsaken him. And everybody thought that it was his end. But in Psalm chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Many there be which say of my soul that there is no help for him in God. And I don't know about you, but there's been many a time where I've felt of myself that there's no help in God. And I've listened to those voices that says, look, God's not going to help you. God can't help you through this. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Salah. But then there's a response that comes to that question. There is a response that comes to him admitting how he feels like there might be no help in God. In verse 3, it says, But thou, O Lord art a shield for me. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down to sleep, and I slept, and I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. And I'm just here to tell somebody, I'm just here to build somebody's faith today. That you need to start putting your hope and trust in the Lord. And you need to start reciting these things. For when that day comes, when you need it most, that is what's going to pour out of your spirit. And that boldness and that, zeal, that zealousness is going to come pouring out of you. And you declare to your season and you declare to the enemy that there is a shepherd and that there is a God that is on your side. He is an ever-present help in the time of need. The Lord always strengthens His people in the time of need. He always strengthens His people in the time of need. 
He's never late, but He is always on time. And that gives me such hope. Because I don't know about you, but I, I, I feel weak very often. I feel very weak. I feel defeated often. But in our times of weakness, as the Scripture says, when we are weak, He is strong. But I don't have it within myself. He does the rest. The Lord stands for His people. And I'm so thankful that that scripture says that those who put their trust in the name of the Lord shall never be ashamed. That means that for anybody, for anyone who puts their hope and their heart and their trust in God, and you have nothing else to lean on, you've come to the end of yourself, you've come to the end of your road, you don't have anything else to give, and you feel like you're at the cliff's edge, if all you have is trust in Jesus, He will not leave you ashamed. Amen. He will not leave you and forsake you to fall off of that cliff. But He will save you and He will deliver you. He will pick you up and set your feet on solid ground. The Lord empowers His people. The Lord delivers for His people. And you know what? The Lord avenges His people. Amen. Maybe you've gone through a season where you feel like some things have been stolen from you. The Lord sees that too. That's why the Scripture says revenge is the Lord's. He will take recompense for what the enemy has done in your life. And He will restore what the enemy has stolen. I believe for, <clears throat> for many that He'll restore the years of prayers and the years of feeling forsaken. He could do it in just an instant. He could take all those years of struggle and turn around in just an instant and deliver you in just a moment. I have a couple more things to say, but if I could get the musicians and the, the worship team up here. Can, can we stand? We may not battle flesh and blood alone. And we may be surrounded by so many things in life right now. And if you think it's going to get better, I, I hate to tell you it's not. There's going to continue to be opposition. There's going to continue to be things waxing more and more cold and worse. There's going to be things that come up. Who knows, they're already talking about another plague. They're already talking about another pandemic. Monkeypox. And they'll use every single thing that they have. Nobody thought two, three years ago that they would use, you know, that a pandemic would close down churches and and take people out of jobs and completely change the world. In 2019, uh, even the beginning of 2020, I'd, I just got a call in, in March and that was the first time I heard of it when I got sent home from work. I never even heard of it or, or thought about it. And there's gonna be things in life that come and take us by surprise. There's gonna be continued situations that come the scripture says that those who endure until the end, the way that we endure is to stand upon the rock. The way that we endure is to stand upon the word of God. If I could tell you and encourage you with anything, it's not really an emotional thing. It's not really something that's, that might drive us to tears. <clears throat> The greatest tool that's at your disposal in your life is the Word of God. That when you begin to use His Word as your prayers,
you begin to stand upon that, we, we begin to realize that though I don't fight against flesh and blood, you know what? The enemy and my adversary isn't fighting against just flesh and blood either. But he's fighting against the Lord God Almighty. He's fighting against an individual who has a covenant with the Lord, whose name is upon us and whose blood is upon us and whose spirit is upon us. And just like those young Hebrew boys and just like David and many, many others recorded in Scripture, if we will put our hope and trust in the Lord, He will see you through it. He will see you to victory. He will take you to victory. Whether he needs to pick you up on, on his shoulders or he needs to drag you there, whatever, he will take you to the finish line. He will see you through it. It was by faith that Enoch walked with God. It was by faith Abraham obeyed. It was by faith for Isaac, for Jacob, for Joseph, for Moses. It goes on. And for you and I, it's by faith. The just live by faith. And faith alone is enough. So when I don't have any answers, when I feel like I'm alone in my season, when I feel like I'm surrounded by the enemy, let faith be your answer. When the voice of the enemy is crying out in, t in your valley, when the mockery of the enemy is coming against you, when you feel down and out, let faith be your answer. Let the Word of God be your answer. And when you do that, He will stand with you in the fiery furnace. He will deliver you from the snares of the enemy. He will pick you up and cover you. He will redeem you. He will save you in your time of need. But all you have to do, Scripture says, is anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. It's not a salvation message. It's talking about someone who's in need. It's talking about anybody, no matter where you are, what, what background you've come from, where, what season you're in. If you call upon the name of the Lord, God will not leave you ashamed. God will not leave you begging for bread. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. I will say of the Lord, and my answer will be faith. And he'll take you through the valley. He'll take you through the battle. So just for a few moments as they sing, I wonder if we could just come and make that declaration to the Lord this afternoon. I don't know if it's customary for you guys to have an altar call, but if you come to this altar, you've been through something, you've been going through something, and you need to make a declaration to the Lord, or you just need to sure up your heart, sure up your faith, for when that season does come, you'll need it. I rely on the Lord, and I live by faith and faith alone. In the name of Jesus.